today on Grace to You. Saul was going one way with no idea of turning to go the other way, and God sovereignly spun him around, a light brighter than the sun, shining around Paul and all those who journeyed with him. You are persecuting me. Why? What in the world makes us so embarrassed about the gospel? I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I would say, beyond the person of our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, that Paul has had the greatest influence on my life, and that influence has been going on for most of my life, pretty intense over the last fifty years or so for sure. Paul, the author of thirteen of the New Testament books, Paul, the looming figure in the book of Acts, and the dominant figure for most of the book of Acts, is the main player on the stage after our Lord ascends back into heaven. He has been for me a model of ministry, a pattern to follow in every way. His conversion is one of the great stories of human history. And as we come into the ninth chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 9, we come to one of the great days in the history of the world, the conversion of a man named Saul. But his conversion again is repeated in the twenty-second chapter of the book of Acts as he gives his own testimony, and then repeated again in the twenty-sixth chapter of Acts. So here in chapter 9 we see this amazing transformation. And then it is rehearsed for us again in chapter 22 and again in chapter 26. It would be hard to imagine that there has been another one like Him. And I believe as we approach the account of His conversion in chapter 9, we have to remember that we've already met Him in the book of Acts. And you remember where we met Him. We met Him back in chapter 7 and verse 58, when the faithful evangelist to the Hellenistic synagogues, a man named Stephen, had preached his wonderful sermon going through the history of the Old Testament and culminating in the arrival of the righteous one, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the Jews had betrayed and murdered. They rushed on Him to stone Him to death. And before casting the stones down on Stephen, it says in verse 58, they laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And chapter 8, verse 1 begins, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Saul was the great persecutor of the early church that caused the church to be scattered. He may have tried to refute them. He certainly tried to silence Stephen, not with an argument, but with an execution. He then rose by his sheer force of leadership and passion to become the leader of the movement to stamp out Christianity. Years later, he said this. It's recorded in Acts 26. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only shut up many of the saints in prison by authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities." This is Saul. Luke 
says it simply, Saul laid waste the church. After successfully clearing Jerusalem of those he believed to be heretics, threatening the true religion of Judaism, he himself decided that he would go after them. It wasn't enough that they left Jerusalem. He wanted to stamp them out, hunt them down. Wherever they were, he heard that a group of them had gone to Damascus. And he secured permission from the religious elites to go to Damascus. And that's where we pick it up in chapter 9. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He launches a fierce campaign chasing down these believers. And he's going to begin with a raid, if you will, on Damascus. He was like a war horse who has the scent of battle and is breathing fury in anticipation of new conquering. Eradication was his objective. And this led to a trip to Damascus, a journey which changed the world. He was so highly respected among the Jewish authorities that he had permission from them to carry his war to distant cities. That's what it says in chapter 26, verse 12, that he'd been given permission to go everywhere and exterminate Christians. The high priest, as president of the Sanhedrin, was head of the Jewish state so far as its internal affairs were concerned. And his authority was upheld by Roman power, and he acted as the one who had absolute authority to give to Saul. With that authority, he takes off for Damascus. Armed with his commission from the high priest to do what he wanted to do, all of his entourage, they almost reach the walls of Damascus, almost. And then we come to verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank." Serious change of plans. What have we here? He ran right into the Lord Jesus Christ. And then came His momentous conversion. I, I want to consider it under four simple features. First, a divine contact. Then divine conviction, divine conversion, divine communion. Just a way to break it down. The divine contact comes in verse 3. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. Now we could add an awful lot to verse 3 because verse 3 is very cryptic, very short. But to do that, I'd have to take you through chapter 22 and chapter 26, and we're not there yet. But let me borrow some things from those two chapters, because in those two chapters, Paul gives his testimony when he's called into court. And if we borrow from what we learn in 22 and 26, we can fill in details. Those chapters tell us it was about noon, midday, sun at the apex. 
And if you've ever stood beneath the glare of the sun in the Middle East at noon, you understand that it is a bright sun. But there was something far brighter, because we read later in the book of Acts that a light shone above the brightness of the sun, shining around Paul and all those who journeyed with him, a light brighter than the sun. The sun is bright but distant. This is in their midst. The whole group then collapses to the ground in sheer terror. We are also told later in the book of Acts that it was a light out of heaven. It was a light, in this verse it also says, from heaven, flashing around them. Miraculous, supernatural, transcending the brightness of the noonday sun. Chapter 26, where the testimony of Paul again is given, it says, the men got up, but Saul remained flat on the ground. Chapter 22, verse 9 says, they heard the sound, they heard noise, but they couldn't understand. It says they didn't understand. They couldn't articulate or distinguish words. And in their lack of clarity, they're very different from Paul. The light breaks through to, to Saul, and he sees Jesus. How do you know he sees Jesus? Well, go down to verse 7. The men who traveled with Him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one, seeing no one. But that's not Paul's testimony. Go to, down to verse 17. Ananias later departs and enters the house, and after laying his hands on Saul, says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road... That's enough. The Lord appeared to him on the road. Down in verse 27, Barnabas took hold of him, brought him to the apostles, described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road. And in his own testimony in chapter 22 and verse 14, let me just read it to you. He said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know His will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from His mouth. Paul saw the Lord. He saw the glorified Christ. He saw the transcendent Christ coming out of the middle of this blazing, shining light. So that's the contact. God sovereignly makes contact with the sinner who is the object of His electing grace and sovereign regenerating power. Not always this dramatically but always this sovereignly. The salvation of anyone is totally initiated by God. Saul was going one way with no idea of turning to go the other way, and God sovereignly spun him around. Divine contact. And then we see in verse 4 the divine conviction. This is very interesting, divine conviction. In bringing a person to salvation, there is an initial contact initiated by God, and then there is the conviction of sin. And where there is genuine salvation, there is a potency to that conviction. And verse 4 says, He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to Him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting Me? He doesn't know what hit Him, obviously. He is laying at the feet of His conqueror. He is in the right position, you might say, for conversion. In Luke's writings, the repetition of a name like this seems to imply a rebuke or a warning, Martha, Martha, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Simon, Simon, here, Saul, Saul. There's an emphatic nature to that repetition. Why are you persecuting Me? For what reason? Remember in John 15, 25, Jesus said, they hated Me without a cause. Why are you doing this? This is a thrilling statement. I need to just take it apart for a minute. 
Why are you persecuting me? Well, wait a minute. Jesus wasn't even around. He was back in heaven. But our Lord identifies for us this very significant reality that to persecute any of His people is to persecute Him, that He is inseparable from His people. He is bound together with all the members of His body so that every stroke which is directed against us is a blow that falls on Him. He is truly identified with us. Persecuting us is persecuting Him. Saul was persecuting Jesus when he persecuted His people. He is hit with the real issue. You've got to understand this. When God initiates salvation, immediately you need to go to the real issue. And the real issue is stated here. You are persecuting Me. Why? That is the issue of conviction that is essential. Why are you treating Jesus the way you're treating Him? That's the issue. There are a lot of sins in the world, but, but the sin that is most important is the knowledge of the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. The issue for conviction is not that a man is a liar, not that a, a woman is cruel or unkind or deceptive or whatever else or immoral. The crime for which people are damned to hell is rejection of Christ. That is the crime of all crimes. That is the unpardonable sin the unforgivable crime. And small, uh, Saul is literally smashed with that indictment. You are persecuting the Son of God. Now that leads to the conversion, the divine conversion in verse 5. This is, again, a very abbreviated, abbreviated account. But verse 5 records, and he said, who are you? What's the next word? Lord. Uh, something dramatic has happened. Who are you, Lord? He's not yet even sure who he's looking at. He'd never seen Jesus before. But even if he had seen Jesus before, this was not going to be the same because Jesus was not the same in his glorified form. But he quickly finds out that he has been indicted for persecuting Jesus, who is Lord. He is now acknowledging that He is Lord. Who are you, Lord? And He said, I am Jesus. And um, chapter 22, verse 8 adds, of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, the very one you've been persecuting. Uh, I would say um, that Jesus has captured Paul's attention, wouldn't you? Filled him with the fear of conviction and presented the truth concerning himself. I am Jesus of Nazareth. The battle was over. The battle was over. It had been a very difficult battle for Saul. He had been kicking against the goads. What does that mean? Goad, a goad was any sharp pointed instrument which was used to pierce or perforate, and you would use them to stab an ox to keep him moving. In fact, um, Shamgar in Judges slew, I think it's 600 men with an ox goad. What does it mean to kick against the goads? It, it means to just inflict pain on yourself by continuing to do what you do. He was literally bashing his own conscience by resisting God. You can't fight God, rebel against God, make war against God, not feel the pain. So all of this is just to tell us of this amazing, amazing encounter. In First contact, God's sovereign grace, conviction of His sin against the Lord Jesus Christ. He responds in humble penitence, and I believe conversion takes place. 
that becomes obvious as the story goes on. A good way to understand the conversion part of the story would be to look for just a minute, and I'll just take a minute to do this, uh, at First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Here Paul gives a testimony to Timothy. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because He considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate His perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in Him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen." That's His testimony. That's the internal testimony. We see the external story in this ninth chapter. Proof of that conversion comes really fast. How do you know He was converted there? I'll give you the proof. It's in His testimony in chapter 22, and I will read this to you. Chapter 22, He's giving His testimony again. Verse 8, I answered, Who are You, Lord? <clears throat> and He said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene whom You're persecuting. And those who were with Me saw the light to be sure, but didn't understand the voice of the One who was speaking to Me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do." How do you know He was converted? What's the first response of a true conversion? Submission. Confessing Him as Lord. He had a new master. Master, Lord, what do you want me to do? He calls Him Lord. He calls Him Lord as everyone must who is saved. He called Him Lord. He recognized the truth that Jesus is Lord. You don't make Him Lord. He is Lord. Chapter 10 of Acts, verse 36, the Word which He sent to the sons of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. The conversion was immediate. Absolutely immediate. What shall I do, Lord? What do you want me to do? Verse 6, get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what to do. The men who traveled with Him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground. Though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. He is broken devastated, shattered, melted down, submissive, compliant, obedient. This is how salvation works. Supernatural divine sovereign contact, conviction of the great sin of rejecting Jesus Christ, conversion into a submissive follower of a new heavenly master. This was total devastation of everything He was. And it was in those days that all that He had considered precious became rubbish. Salvation was sudden, but its depth are often plumbed slowly. He is now stunned. He is helpless. He is friendless. He has friends who are now enemies, and enemies who don't know they're to be friends. For three days he communed with his Lord. Well, it's a hard question to answer what single thing about Paul is compelling to me. Everything about him is compelling to me, absolutely everything about him. Um, his um, 
passion for sacrificial ministry, his willingness to put his life on the line. Uh, you know, when he went to a town, he didn't ask what the hotel was like, he asked what the jail was like because he knew that's where he'd end up. Uh, he suffered. I mean, he gives a litany of his sufferings in his second letter to the Corinthians. He just goes on and on and on and on and, and multiple horrendous situations in danger from beginning to end. So this level of sacrifice is so rare. That, that's the first thing that captivates my own heart is that kind of utter selflessness, even to the point of death. The second thing that, that drives me to him as a model for me is his relentless zeal for the truth and the building of the church on the truth. His heart was for the church. He talks about his suffering in 2 Corinthians 11, he even lays it out in detail. And then he says, beyond all this is the care of the churches. And he says, who sins and I don't feel the pain. That, that's, that's amazing. He is so involved with the people that he shepherds that he feels the pain of their own sin. That is a model of spiritual manhood. That is a model of ministry. That is a model of shepherding and pastoring that should captivate anybody. And then you add to that 13 letters that he has written defining essentially the gospel in its fullness. You have most of the book of Acts, the history of the early church, devoted to him. So all that's in Acts, all that's in the 13 epistles that he wrote, gives you beyond the man's character, his doctrine which came right out of heaven. And he was the tool that the Lord used to be the writer of divine revelation. And most people don't see the package of his life. And uh, the reason that I put together one faithful life is to pull everything in the New Testament about the Apostle Paul into one story. And it is an incredible story. This gives you this incredible biography of this man and his ministry and his writings. And by the way, I don't think this has ever been done, I mean ever, a, a harmonizing of the life and letters of Paul. It's a marvelous, I think, life-transforming look at this most remarkable apostle. To learn more about the life of the Apostle Paul, pick up a copy of John MacArthur's book entitled One Faithful Life. Filled with important background information, this chronological narrative weaves together Paul's letters with the book of Acts revealing a unique look at the man behind the letters and his impact on the early church. Order a copy today by giving us a call at 888-57-GRACE or visiting our website gty.org and searching for One Faithful Life in our bookstore. On behalf of Pastor John and all of us at Grace to You, thanks for joining us today in Unleashing God's Truth, one verse at a time.